This is the BBC. This podcast is supported by advertising outside the UK. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. I'm Simon Armitage and you're listening to The Poet Laureate Has Gone To His Shed. It's a shed tucked away in the Pennine Hills where all year I've been trying to write haiku, those finicky, fiddly little three-line poems about nature and the weather that look so simple but are almost impossible to perfect. So, to be honest, any kind of intrusion or distraction is very welcome from anyone kind or curious enough to call in for a natter. So, here's a sentence I never thought I'd hear myself saying. My guest in the shed today is J.K. Rowling. And in terms of an introduction, I don't think anything else is necessary other than to say welcome and thanks so much for dropping by. It's an absolute pleasure to be in your shed instead of my shed. With other guests on previous occasions, when I've started talking about sheds, it's triggered memories of of childhood for them. Did sheds figure in your upbringing? Yeah, very much so, but it was my, my father's space, so that made it quite a scary space. But I built a structure in the garden that I call the writing room. There's a lot of wood. It's got a very shed-like roof. Is this where you live now? Yeah, our house in Edinburgh. And that's where I do 90% of my writing. But do you always write in here? Because I can write anywhere. And, you know, sometimes the mood grabs you in the bathroom or something. So I've been known to lie flat on the bathroom floor and just (laughs) type or write. But mostly I write in in the writing room. Yeah, I prefer it when it's warm. Probably not yeah. as warm as it is today, it's stifling. But the good thing about being out here is there's no internet. Exactly, I haven't got internet out there either. So if I want to look something up, I have to walk back over to the kitchen and connect and, you know, maps normally. Because when I'm writing my detective books, that you know, I often need to work out routes and distances and alibis. They have to be forensically correct. Yeah, well, that's the copy editor's job, isn't it? <laughs> I make the mistake, she comes along and says, yeah, no, that would, that can't happen. And then you have to go back in and rewrite it. But, yeah, I try, I really try and get it right on the first attempt. My approach to research tends to be write it first and go and look it up afterwards. Yeah, well, yeah. I, the worst one I ever did in the Galbraith books was I put the Queen's Golden Jubilee in the wrong year, which you'd think, you would think, you know, but I'm appalling with knowing years that things happen this is why I will never be able to write any memoirs because I can't remember when when things happened that's got me into trouble more than once yeah so my editor he was very kind he didn't laugh at me we work with our imagination don't we well part of what I love about writing the Galbraith books is that I am engaging with the real world which I find very satisfying after 17 years of just being in a completely imaginary world so I I really do enjoy the research part of the Galbraith books but you're right, my forte is not meticulous accuracy. So it's very lucky there are a couple of nets to catch me when I fall, as yeah. I frequently do. We all need editors, don't we? For but sure. it, the, 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 the shed was a, a sort of an out-of-bound space, was it, before? Yeah, completely. But that, of course, makes it mysterious and interesting. And I love the, the look and the smell of wood. I love this place you've got here, which isn't helpful to anyone listening. But I can see, I can see owls. You've, you've got... Pottery owls, butterflies. This is very familiar to me because I've got little bits and pieces lying around in my writing room that have to do with my sort of internal life, like little objects that I like. You know what I mean? It's not a, it's not a curated collection. Yeah. I just have objects around that I find stimulating and pleasing. I once went to Robert Graves' house in Dea in Mallorca and his desk... This was after he died, and I think it's become a, a sort of museum now, but his his desk was covered in animal trinkets, you know, carvings, uh, ornaments, objects, sort of totemistic things, but none of them I, I imagine particularly valuable. Exactly. Yeah. I'm not talking here. Some of the things, that these little bits and pieces I've got in the writer room, they're small plastic objects. Th- these aren't valuable curios. I went to um, Hemingway's house down in... Flo- um, do I mean Florida? You can get one of your your, your editors okay. to look at Let's just that. someone call the copy editor and check which writing room I went to see because I am so, I'm so unlike my husband who who literally isn't happy unless he knows exactly where he is on a map. Now I don't know north from west. I 
I'm a bit clueless. Anyway, so Hemingway's writing room, which you couldn't actually enter, was very like that. These these strange, quite Hemingway-esque objects hanging around, wooden mask. It had been tidied, and of course you always wish you could have just have seen it in the messy state, but... Well, my, I don't know about you, but the, this shed is actually very tidy. My writing room is not a very tidy place. So Unless you've tied it, just pretend you tied it for me and it will make me feel better <laughs> about the habitual state of my writing room. It's a bit of a storeroom in the winter because you just sort of cram everything in here. It interests me with, with writers that no matter what sort of spaces and rooms we end up in and what you know the houses we, we, we occupy and inhabit, a lot of people seem to want something smaller yeah. of human proportion to almost cocoon themselves in when when they write you know bring things down to a slightly different scale i think that's spot on i wanted a, a small space and it, it is small but it's got a view and you've got the most magnificent view here i don't love writing in windowless spaces although i have done it but yeah my absolute ideal is definitely a room with a view yeah I've taken part in the Edinburgh Book Festival pretty much every year for the last 20 years and I've had numerous cups of tea and cakes in Nicholson's and, and the Elephant House. Famously, they were your haunts, weren't they? Somewhere where you'd go and write. To they were. With. Nicholson's at the time was co-owned by my brother-in-law so they were really sweet about me. I mean, it's a, it, it's a tough old business, you know, running restaurants, as I know from my chef brother-in-law. Their margins were tight and they were letting me take it up a table and drink co- one, linger over one coffee, God bless them. And I tried to repay them by giving interviews in there. When, it, you know, when Philosopher's Stone was published, I, I was thinking, well, you know, let's give the restaurant some publicity because they've let me, they've let me sit here over a cooling coffee for so long. And then I was in there years later and uh, Dougal, one of the owners who, who was still there, he said to me, oh, I'm really glad you came in. We've got about six Harry Potter books here for you to sign. And I thought they were for the staff. So I said, oh, yeah, fair enough. And he went, yeah, and I've got to, then I've got to send them back to people. I said, what? And he was just taking books from people who were coming in. I said, you're not even making them buy food. Dougal, come on now. And I felt really bad. Yeah, so Nichols and the Elephant House Cafe I used to work in. That's a lovely space with a really great view of the castle. And I met the owner years later and he said um you never come in anymore you know in a dream world yes i'd still go in there but it's just it's not humanly possible anymore to yeah. go in there and write so i i had to, i had to stop writing in cafes i've really loved it but i it i just couldn't anymore there's a a cafe in huddersfield actually it's a it's a sort of chain of of cafes called the merry england which are sort of fake Tudor cafes. Mm. And even though everything in Huddersfield's pretty much been removed at some point and replaced, these fake Tudor cafes <laughs> have, have stayed there. We used to go in there, and they've got a place in my heart because they'd let us sit there exactly. writing our poems and trying to be, you know, bohemian exactly. in, in Huddersfield in the, in the 80s. Just somewhere, especially back in the day, where, where you could go, because there wasn't really that... Cafe culture was there of you know where you can go in somewhere and it's shabby chic and sit on a settee with your your laptop just somewhere to go keep warm write your poems and, and buy a cuppa every now and again exactly and I'd come I I went to Edinburgh in late 1993 I think I do have that year right straight from Portugal which obviously does have an incredibly <laughs> great cafe culture and I'd been sitting in in nice warm cafes over there drinking and and this cups or of espresso well. or or outside <laughs> yeah. exactly it's a totally different culture and to get to edinburgh was um a hell of a culture shock I, yeah it really was mm. yeah do you think sometimes we need that background chatter as well as as writers occasionally i'll be sitting in here or in my study in the house and it's too quiet yeah. you know i want something that's um I don't know, of this world, without it being interference or, or distraction. That is perfectly expressed. That is exactly how I feel. And I used to, um, you know, when I was completely anonymous and, and completely free, it was exactly that. I really enjoyed being in the world, but in my world, simultaneously. And I think it's it's that. It's being... Sometimes the silence can be a little spooky, can't it, when you're living in your head? 
and you do just want that thread still connecting you to the physical world. And I, yeah, I, I used to love writing in cafes. It, originally, I mean, the the sort of urban legend, which is actually true, but it sort of became part of the story of Potter. But it, this part is true. My flat was bitterly cold. It was a glorified bedsit, so cafes were warm. And it was also true that I could only really work when my daughter was asleep because she was tiny. And I did walk her around and she would fall asleep. And I'd just think, right, I've got an hour and a half because she was quite a good napper. And then I would run in and, you know, that would maybe do me a quarter of a chapter or the first draft of a quarter of a chapter or something. Having brought a daughter up in a sort of traditional family, it's hats off to anybody who's, who's found time to, to write and, and do all the, the parenting at the same time. I actually owe Jessica a lot, <laughs> a lot, because, well, among the many millions of things I owe her, one of the things I owe her is it really made me focus. My life was, I'd really, I'd really messed up my life, it was the way I saw it. But actually, that stripped away all of the inessential. And I absolutely was at a point where I thought, the worst that can happen here is that every publisher turns down this book. Big deal. Compared to what we've just survived, that's nothing. And I am going to finish this book. And um, bless her, she was, she was a real sweetheart. I mean, she's a real live wire when she was little. Um, so when she was awake, yeah, there wasn't do- a lot I could really do. Very occasionally, you could persuade her to sit down and watch a video. But I had to be in the room participating in it with her but I could sneakily maybe write because it was all hammered in the first book yeah it, it was tough but at the same time it being tough really did make me focus yeah. and I feel like it's a really great training because you know I'm sure you get this question all the time and it maybe it, maybe it's different for a poet because uh, I'm such an appalling poet I have no idea how you do what you do but I just cut the ends of the lines off that is so funny <laughs> I want to write that. Oh, my, I have quotations painted on my writing room wall and I'm going to quote you. I'll just cut the lines off. Simon Arfty. That's brilliant. What the hell was I just saying? don't know if they say this to you. Do you only write when you're inspired? And I, in my head, I say, well, if I only write when I'm inspired, I've written half a book. Yeah. You know, yeah. a professional writer has to push through. We, we all love those moments of brilliant inspiration but it's the work you do after that 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 count, or that's how I see it. So sometimes I read about writers having elaborate rituals. You know, I like the candles, and they had to be in the perfect space, and they they had to make sure the house was empty. But a CD of whale songs. Exactly. And I was thinking, (laughs) I once wrote a paragraph of Harry Potter sitting on a public loo. (laughs) That I literally, that happened. You know what? I, it was the moment. I had no time. It's going to happen. I have to happen now. So... It made me very unprecious about the conditions I need to write. And, and that was good because, you know what, it meant I could raise my kids and keep going. Maybe they would have been better written if I hadn't, you know, had that life. But that's what it was. That's just what it was. That uh, loo is obviously going to turn up at Sotheby's one day. For, for I'm not part. telling anyone where that loo was. I'm too embarrassed. I can't believe I've told you that, but that is the truth. You kind of touched on it, Joe, issues about privacy and you know it's a sort of contradiction among writers that you know we want to be acclaimed and known uh, but we need to be able to go about in the world sort of incognito to observe it and not become detached from it as one of the most successful writers of all time is it possible to retain any kind of anonymity or invisibility it is but you you've you've got to be smart about it I mean, obviously, I don't go and hang around <laughs> the Harry Potter merchandising <laughs> department stores. That would, that yeah, would look yeah, a bit stuff off. like that. In fact, my my son, we were in a department store and we walked. I didn't know this department store at all, and we, and we turned left, and there was a whole load of Harry Potter merchandise right in front of us, and um, there were some young people browsing it. And I sort of turned to go, and my son said, how much will you pay me to stop me shouting, she's here, J.K. Rowling's here? <laughs> I mean, I mean, I was half laughing and half kind of terrified because he had that glint in his eye. I just I, we won't get out of here for an hour. Come on, we've got to go, 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 go. But um, honestly, I'm not that distinctive looking, and I'm quite small. And, you know, I do live a pretty normal life, to be honest. I used to be maybe a bit naive because I, I always used to think, oh, the 
people in Edinburgh don't know who the hell I am and it never really dawned on me that I'd become that recognisable. And then, funnily enough, and, and really touchingly, actually, um, I gave a donation to MS Research and the next time I went into town to one of my favourite cafes to write, about five people walked up to me and said, look, I just, I've seen you around, never wanted to, you know, disturb you. I just want to say my uncle's got MS. And, but it was very, very touching. But I then realised, oh, actually, yeah, people have noticed me. Yeah. But, you know, I'm in context. I'm in Edinburgh. There are plenty of places I go and I don't think anyone ever noticed me, which is, which is great, to be honest. It's on a completely different scale, but I don't really notice it, but my wife does. So we'll be walking down the street and she'll say, oh, you've just been outed. My two younger kids call it spotage. <laughs> spotage. Yeah, it's, like, it's supposed to be a code. I'm like, that's, that's not a very, it's quite a transparent code. I think people will be able to work. So um, one of them will matter to me, spotage is occurring. This sounds very ungrateful. I have to say that re- I'm sure you feel the same way. Readers coming up to you and saying, you know, your book saved me in a dark moment. Your book made meant so much to me growing up. It, it, it's the most incredible thing. Yeah. Probably the only... And I love it. It's a lovely, wonderful thing. And there are two things I would say, though. One is exactly what you've just said. It is essential for us to... Ret- you know, I never wanted to be a celebrity. That sounds ungrateful because, obviously, I've been enormously blessed. I wanted to be a writer. And, yes... All of us think, oh, I hope people like the books, but things slightly overshot the mark in, in, in that respect. So some of it's really beautiful, but you do want that ability still just to slip into the crowd and just watch yeah. life. Yeah. And then the other thing is that when I'm with my kids particularly, because everyone nowadays has got a camera, yeah. that's kind of why we've got that word, because often that means someone's raised a camera and is filming, and I, I don't like my family being then put on social media. So that stuff makes me a little bit edgy. If you're putting a quote of mine on your wall, I'm now going to put yours on my wall, which is things overshot a little bit. <laughs> you can have it. Yep, that's that's my gift to you. <laughs> if it helps with the anonymity, I was in a supermarket in Huddersfield a few weeks ago and saw on the shelf a Harry Potter cloak of invisibility for 19.99. Oh, that's going cheap. Brilliant. Yeah, except I could see it. So. <laughs> Maybe, maybe it only works when you put it on. <laughs> ah, I hadn't thought of that. I didn't, I didn't get I didn't get to the sort of trying on yeah. stage. It's coming on to a slightly different subject. I, I've always been fascinated by writers who go by their initials rather than their names. So, yeah. you know, T.S. Eliot, W.H. Auden, R.S. Thomas, J.R.R. Tolkien. Am I right in thinking your decision to be known as... Uh, J.K. Rowling, came about through a recommendation from your your publisher? Partly right. I've actually never said part of this before. Um, It is true that my publisher felt that this was a book that boys would also like, and they definitely were keen to uh, unisex me a bit. This is the bit I've never actually said before. I actually wanted to be published under a completely different name (laughs) because... I'd come out of this very um, difficult marriage and I was a little bit paranoid. It was silly, really, because my ex-husband knew what, knew what I'd been writing. He never read it, but he, he, we had talked about it. So it, if he ever heard about it, I suppose he would know it was me. But I didn't imagine it was going to be a, a success. I didn't imagine it was going to be in Portugal. But I was a little bit paranoid at the time. You thought it might make you vulnerable? I I actually had a restraining order out against my ex-husband. So uh, as we got nearer to publication, I thought maybe maybe I will, uh, I'll I'll just publish this under a different name. I'll have a pen name and that would be great. So JK was actually suited me a bit to have, to not, to have my name on there somehow. Although of course it is my surname, but I don't really feel like JK. I did you have another name lined up if it wasn't going to be anything with Rowling in it? Yeah, and funnily enough, the surname I wanted to use was Oliver, and I don't really know why it was Oliver, but it was. Um, and I met the comedian John Oliver, and I thought, like, you know, it would have been like I was his sister. It was, you know, you, 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 you come across these people with names that have such strange resonances. Mm. Anyway, there you are. Do you think that having a sort of writing name that you're kind of creating a, a writing persona. So, you know, when you're loading the dishwasher or brushing your teeth, you're, you're Joanne. But when you sit down to write, you are J.K. Rowling or, or you are Robert Galbraith. Does something else come over you connected with the writing name? 
honestly know. I feel disconnected from the person who's written, written about in the papers, but I think that's a quite a universal experience, I think. I'm sure you have had that yeah, experience. Yes, disembodied. Yeah, it's as though there's this this other entity that has a similar name is out there doing things that you don't always recognise, even if they are things you did. Uh, but no, the same person who brushes her teeth and loads the dishwasher is definitely sitting down to write. I, those those people are all integrated. I feel, I, I don't feel any different. I've sometimes wondered about whether I could have gone around as S.R. Armitage. Robert is my middle name. But um, my mum my used to work in a school and they used to call him his Sarmitage, Mrs. Sarmitage, and it just all slid into one. Yeah. So, I didn't, JK is good because it's got a nice rhyming quality. About this is it. this is such a coincidence because on the way to the uh, airport this morning, my husband was driving me because I can't drive. He was talking about he really dislikes the fact that his name Neil Murray. People never get it on the first go. They always think he's Ian or Liam, mm. and he was. Uh, I don't even know why we were talking about that, but we were. So yeah. Sarmatage, exactly, yeah. <laughs> it's sort of a, a bit of a cliché fanboy question about writing longhand or straight into the keypad, but I am genuinely intrigued when I talk to other writers uh, about you know the process mm-hmm. of making words. Do you still write things out into, into books? No, but I do still love writing longhand into books. So I have... Um, tons of notebooks and I, I write a lot of dialogue down physic you know I, I, I hand write a lot of dialogue I write ideas down um, I work out bits of plans by hand it's such a prosaic reason for writing longhand but to me it's important you get to keep everything mm. you know the thing is with a computer you, when, when it's deleted you can't go back you think oh damn it yeah, I know yeah. I planned a chapter there and I know that was, I think that would have worked better and it's gone, it's gone, it's gone. But I've learned that just keep saving. So I've got, you know, 52 versions of a plan. Just make sure you save it and, and, and go again. But the great thing, I love looking back over my old notebooks. It's a true record of, of, of where everything came from. I always say to my students that it's, it's good to build up a kind of archaeology of your work that you can look back on, even if it's just about seeing your mistakes, where, exactly. where you went wrong. Because, yeah, you're right, deleting everything just leads to this idea that something was perfected right exactly. from, from the beginning. Is there a, a J.K. Rowling archive somewhere? No, of, of I'm, no, no, it's all, I've got it all. Um, I was talking to Ian Rankin about this the other day because he's donated his papers to the um, National Library of Scotland. I think that's right. But you've got all yours. But I've still still got mine, yeah. Yeah. I'm not even really sitting on them. It's just, I don't know. I feel, I don't know what I'm going to do with any of it. Part of me thinks I'll just have a big bonfire. Um, (laughs) Don't do that. No, I don't know. You know, Nabokov said that awful thing about people exhibiting their first drafts. It's like passing around samples of sputum. (laughs) That's one of the quotations I've got on my writing wall. And I kind of, I do feel like it's passing around samples of sputum, yeah. I I keep a notebook, and I noticed at one point I was getting very self-conscious about it. So when oh, I approached the the notebook, it wasn't a notebook anymore. It was some sort of yeah artifact, and it, it wasn't doing its job. You know, it wasn't a place where I could make mistakes anymore. And also, I'd started putting stickers in there as well of you know like I don't know luggage tags and train tickets and uh, labels from wine bottles and it, it got to the point where I couldn't even write in it that's you know, it's, it's sort of that's so <laughs> the, no my notebooks are not like that you told me to bring a meaningful object well there are two objects in my hand I should say for people who can't actually see why I'm showing Simon these are two minuscule very old notebooks and these were the, my first Potter notebooks and to date only three people including me have ever seen them I've never shown people this because there are things in these notebooks that I just didn't want seen. Um, That's amazing. So I remember buying these in an art gallery in London in the early 90s. Bought them both at the same time. And I must have started writing in them in either 91 or 92 uh, because this is such early stuff. The little sort of they're little, tiny, little, thin paperback, paperback with with sort of flowers on. Yes, the one's got a reproduction of I think that's a Dutch still life, and one's just got a William Morris type cover. I nearly chickened out of bringing these, Simon, and I'm not going to show you the bit I'm talking about because I flicked through them last night. I got down, them down from the attic, and I realised there's an appalling poem in one of them. Oh my God! I've just seen something even worse. We'll glance over that. 
So um, <laughs> there's an appalling, dark, very tragic poem. I, I want to hear You're the nine, terrible no, <laughs> I'm, saying, I'm not reading that to the poet laureate, dear God. Well, honestly, it nearly stopped me bringing it. But they're scribbled notes, aren't they, and lists rather than lists, paragraphs and sentences. Yeah, exactly, because I, I was, at the time when I was jotting things in these notebooks, I had started writing properly. So old phone numbers in, in Portugal, doodles, oh, yeah. reminders of things I've got to do, and then suddenly you've got a bit of dialogue that actually did end up in Philosopher's Stone, the difference between a stalactite and a stalagmite. Um, Salamite has got an M in it, but said Harry, I think that's as clear as an answer as you could wish for, said, and that's an old name for Dumbledore that I changed. What so was it? I'm not going to tell you because it's so rubbish. <laughs> and this, I actually remember doing this. So I had a couple of books that were full of fabulous, just random words from different cultures, magical spells, and a lot of that ended up in Potter. Like Alohomora, it means favourable to thieves. And this is funny, password for Slitherites. They were called Slitherites before they became Slytherins. I love looking back at some of this because there are names here that I didn't use till I hit Fantastic Beasts, like Pique, which is French for um, spade, as in cards. I, I wanted to have a cartomancy teacher. I changed all this when I got to the, actually write the book. But at one point, and I was going to have this French guy who was a ghost, but the ghost became Professor Bins. And I called him Peaks. And then when I created the American Ministry for Fantastic Beasts, I used peakery from this word. Mm. So it is, it's exactly what you've just said. It's archaeology. So I was just trying to work out who, who all the teachers were. And one of these books, I've got the names of everyone in Harry's year with little notes on them. That's the terrible poem. We'll pass over that. Now that there, I'd made a list in this book of the stuff I needed to sort out before I left my ex-husband. So that's... <laughs> Leaving was kind of tricky. <laughs> So, yeah, suddenly in the back... So it's fiction mixed with it's autobiography, fiction, mixed with autobiography, practicality. practical stuff, very strange poems. And then this is absolutely classic, and this is one of the main reasons I've never... My ex-husband and I used to play gin rummy a lot, and at this time, he and I were the only two human beings on Earth That's who knew Dumbledore the names Dumbledore and Voldemort. Voldemort. And I'd called myself Dumbledore, <laughs> inevitably, and him Voldemort. And that's his handwriting, <laughs> keeping score beneath. And then that's his handwriting, calling me Hermione and himself Harry. And, he was and who's, not who's very won? like Harry Potter. Who won on those two, two um, games? Well, you'll be pleased to see. I actually thrashed him both times. So. <laughs> <laughs> and as that's his handwriting, you can be quite sure. Anyway. They're, they're incredible, Joe. So, yes. So, I, it's you. So, I thought I had to show you this. And these were the names of all the people from in Harry's year. I've said, that means pure blood, actually. Lavender brown. That means pure blood. Because a wizard in a witch hat. Oh, a bird. A oh, bird just hit the window. Oh, it came in and it's gone. It's was an it? omen. Yeah, it's a blue tip. It's an omen saying, never take that terrible poem no, out of the see, attic you, you, ever again. You've got the book it's... of spells out. But the birds, <laughs> the birds are coming. The birds are coming. <laughs> and then there are just random thoughts that I was having, some of which were very dark. It's just, it. these mean so much to me, these two little books, because cheek by jowl, you've got the whole list of Harry's year all the names that I was going to use for 17 years, all with these little annotations to remind me who they were. And, and then... Just read that little list there on that page. Abbott, Hannah, Bone, Susan, Boot, Trevor, Brocklehurst, Mandy, Brown, Lavender, Bullstrode, Millicent, Corner, Michael, Cornfoot, Stephen, and on and down and down and down they go. But I'm pretty sure that Malfoy wasn't called Malfoy at this point. Yeah, because I wrote him in. Draco Malfoy, I wrote him in. And you've got little sort of symbols. Yeah, little symbols remind me of stars um, and their different. ancestry because I wanted a balance of wizard borns and um, muggle borns and then then the houses. At Slytherin used to have a Y in it. It was Sligarite at one point. I God knows where that came from. And then it became Slytherin. So, yeah. And then cheat by jowl with all of this, I've got really dark jottings about what I was going through at the time. So this is about the most personal thing. Yeah. These mean so much to me. And do you know what? The fact that they're tiny and cheap means and also they travelled around with me. Oh, yeah, they? completely. They've they're been in your back really pocket. Really easy to shove into a bag yeah. or in your back yeah. pocket, exactly. They're not precious, are they? Well, they are precious. The most precious things are not yeah. the things that you consciously... Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it, I do. Like, I've always been aware that if I showed someone this, 
There are people who would be almost disappointed. That's where Potter started. I was expecting a tooled leather book <laughs> with a quill. And you think, no, that's never where and this so stuff the starts. Fairy dust to come out. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And no, that's never where it starts. It starts in a in a very ordinary place and in, with very ordinary little notebooks. And you, there you go. We're doing this in reverse now because you preempted the feature in the in the oh, show, the show and tell. No, I no, just... it's 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 great. It's great to do things differently. And thank you so much for showing me those books. That is absolutely incredible. I'm worried now that my show and tell is not <laughs> is not going to to live up to that. Also, we've missed out on the feature signature tune for the show and tell. So we can do that in reverse. I've been writing haikus here in the in the shed this summer. And the, the most famous haiku of all time is Basho's haiku about a frog jumping into a pond. So, would you like, as your little signature tune uh, backdated to the show and tell feature, the, the sound of the frog or the sound of the frog jumping into the pond? Pond. Pond, okay. Please. Here it comes. <laughs> I love that! <laughs> oh, it's amazing! I also love that. That's those. the frog. We'll do. We'll do. Well, that will come into play later. So my show and tell actually is not completely unconnected to yours there. So I had no sort of pedigree in writing. It was, you know, the, the fact that I started writing poems was completely unexpected by everybody, including myself. And I've said before that it, I don't know whether you felt the same, but it, it never gets any better than seeing your first thing never. in print because you've gone from nothing. To something so that increases completely exponential you know the, the the acceleration there is you never repeat that and I, I think it might have been for that reason that I kept this is so this is my, it's my first oh. royalty check well it's oh. not even royalties it was for a, a poem published in a magazine in Leicester called other poetry and this is the check and it's dated the 13th of the 8th 1987 and it is for the glorious sum of Two pounds. Two pounds. I, and I bet you've never made a better two pounds. No, exactly. And never cashed it in either, so... Um, that should be in a frame on this wall. That's. I love that you've still got that. That's yeah. amazing. I don't know whether at the time I, I didn't cash it out of complacency or whether I just knew uh, that... There'll be plenty point. more where that's coming from. <laughs> <laughs> I see Poet Laureate in my future. <laughs> <laughs> as if any of us think that as if any yeah, of us can get my ass going down to the bank with that don't get out of bed for it <laughs> <laughs> yeah it, it is I think like your notebooks there some kind of seed or cornerstone or keystone just something that everything else was going to be based on yeah. or grow, grow from Exa exactly that talking about beginnings I was thinking about uh, the poet Cadman so he was a farmhand in the abbey at Whitby. And this is as the Venerable Bede tells a story, in, in the I think in the 7th century. And there is quite a, a sort of splendid occasion going on in the hall. And Cadman, uh, because he is uneducated, can't write, can't sing, goes out into, I think, the barn... And a song comes to him with lyrics about the creation of the world. And he tells somebody about this, and it becomes the first poem ever in English. So Cadman's hymn is known as the first ever English poem, written by a farmhand who couldn't write wow. and had no education. It's probably a myth, but it's, it, it's a great story. And I think we've all got stories about where we started writing that have the truth in them or versions of the truth. This is my way of asking you about you conceiving the Harry Potter series on a train from Manchester, Manchester to, to London when it was delayed. That is completely true. And even I sometimes think that is true, isn't it? Because I've told the story so many times, but I, it's, it's a really vivid memory. That's the truth. Yeah, that's what happened. How long was the train delayed for? Yeah, I honestly couldn't tell you, but it was it was delayed and it was packed. And um, I just sat and thought and thought and thought. And I had been writing. I mean, I you know, it, this is all literally all I ever wanted to do. From my earliest childhood, when I understood that someone wrote the books that my mother was reading to me, I wanted to write books. So that never changed. There was nothing else I ever wanted to do. But I'd never been so excited by an idea. 
So uh, I'd never even considered writing a book for children. I'm not sure, actually, initially, I really fully thought children's book because I was just thinking about the ideas. I mean, obviously, it was a children's book, but you know what it's like. You don't conceive of things from the outside in. You think of them from the inside out, I think. So all these ideas are firing in my head. And I got home and started writing. That piece of paper I haven't got. I don't know what became of that piece of paper because, of course, you don't know, do you? But I have got a very early piece of my kind of first attempt to actually begin the story. I do still have that, uh, which is very different. It started initially in a very different way. And then over sort of seven years, as I was building and building and building this world, the first book really changed shape as well. Is there somewhere in Staffordshire at the side of the train line a plaque? (laughs) (laughs) But again, you know, people... It always makes me laugh, particularly with Potter, because, I mean, I just don't know how many different places have claimed to be the real Diagon Alley and the real this and it all grew out of my head in a grotty flat in Clapham you know I hadn't seen any of these places but well it's a it's a work of imagination it's a work of fantasy right we come now to the one or the other feature okay and this time Joe you're gonna have to have the frog noise if that's all right that's all right I'm okay with that if I'd known that was the frog noise yeah. yeah, well, that's what happens. People do that, you see. They go for the frog, jump into the pond noise, thinking it's going to be exotic, lots of splashes, that kind of thing. And then they see the little wooden frog with the with the drumstick. I love that. It's gorgeous, isn't it? That is really gorgeous. So, one or the other. Go on, then. Day or night? <sighs> I am a night owl, and I... I've done some of my best work at night, so I'm probably going to have to say night. Spring or autumn? God, that's really tough. I would have said autumn, but I think because I'm getting older, I'm going to say spring. Witches or wizards? Witches every time. Museum or gallery? Oh, now that really depends on the gallery and less on the museum. So I'm probably going to have to say museum. Susie and the Banshees or the Slits? Mm. It's the Slits, yeah. The Slits, yeah. yeah. Passenger seat or driving seat? Well, I can't drive, so I think everyone will be happy to know that I'm (laughs) normally in the passenger seat. Everybody will be safer. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. much safer. Middle Earth or Narnia? Narnia. North or South? Mm, Probably North. Lightning or Rainbow? Oh, lightning. I love storms. J.R.R. Tolkien or C.S. Lewis? Well, I know I've just said Narnia. You can compensate now if you want. <laughs> um, pretty much a, de- a dead heat. A dead yeah. Heat. Yep. yeah. God or no God? Oh, come on. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> I can't do this. I've asked people worse questions. I asked somebody mum or dad once. Oh, that's terrible. I should be glad you're not asking me to choose between you can my play children. A, you can play a pass on that one then. Okay. <laughs> Ruth Rendell or P.D. James? That is a killer question. You're making me think I've really chosen the questions very well. Here. Yeah, you have. You really have. That's a killer question. Do you know what? I'm going to say James, but it's by such a tiny okay. margin. Yeah. Ghosts or no ghosts? Well, that's a bit like the God or the no God question because I'm sort of yes and no. Wine or whiskey? Oh, whiskey, definitely. Do- dog or cat? Dog. Arthur's Seat or Glastonbury Tour? Oh, come on, Arthur's Seat. It's my... Yeah. I'm going back to this because I'm thinking about when I was growing up, me and my sister used to argue about it all the time. Washing up or drying? That's so funny. Right, which one did you hate? I hated washing up. Well, we both hated drying. Really? Yeah. You and your... Is it your sister? Sister, younger yeah. sister, yeah. We're, we're a year and 11 months apart. And yeah, we both always wanted to wash, which, in retrospect, why? Because nowadays I would choose to dry up. The washing was always a bit messy and exactly. you had to touch sort of wet, sloppy food and things like that. And the drying, you could sort of put it off. You'd think, I'll do it later on, by which time you've we, gone out. We were not growing up in a household where you could put those things off, trust <laughs> okay. me. And also it was quite a cold house, so maybe it was just the hot water. The hot water, Thinking yeah. back, that, put, that's put probably Delve in your yeah. hands into the warm yeah. em- embryonic fluid. <laughs> Last one, immortality or omnipotence? Mm. I think they'd both be terrible. 
I, I wouldn't want either of them. Because immortality, it's useless to me. All my loved ones are going to die, unless we're all immortal together. But yeah. even then, I, I just, I have questions yeah. about immortality and om- omnipotence. I mean, what a, what a burden. What a burden. I can't fix everything in the world, but I would be expected to. Yeah. And I would know things that I didn't want to know. Sometimes ignorance is bliss. Yeah, it's a, the, there's not much to choose there, is there? Not really. really. Okay. Why crime fiction, Joe? Why detective fiction? I always wanted to do it. You know, I, I really always wanted to do it. And I think probably I would have done it before Potter if I'd had the right idea. Although I think I needed to have lived a bit more than I had. I say that by the time I finished Philosopher's Stone, I'd lived quite a lot. But when I had the first idea, I was just 25 and I hadn't, you know, I'd been through some experiences and I was out in the world and I was working, but I didn't maybe have the breadth of experience that I then managed to bring to the series. And I think for crime fiction, it's good to have knocked around a bit met a lot of different kinds of people and maybe shed some of your innocence. Was <laughs> it something nature. that you were reading a lot? Yeah, for you know, my my idea of a fun beach read is a whodunit, for sure. And I read, um, in my teens, I read um, tons of Golden Age detective, right? All the all the big women, you know, the um, Christie and Sayers and Allingham and uh, Marsh I read and love Sherlock Holmes as who doesn't. It was something I always wanted to do. I really enjoy the construction of plots. I love my detective duo. I really enjoy writing them, so it's a nice combination. When you chose another pseudonym for yeah. your books, for the uh, Robert I mean, I, just, I wanted not to be J.K. Rowling. I just wanted not to be J.K. Rowling. I really did. And I'd always... I actually wrote The Cuckoo's Calling, which was the first Galbraith, before I wrote The Casual Vacancy. Right. And then it sat sort of around a bit and I and then I decided to start submitting it to um, publishers under a pseudonym Was that nom de plume because you wanted to be judged by your your writing and not by your reputation? It was a couple of things I had this real craving to go back to this and for the listeners that I am pointing at Simon's cheque for £2 I wanted to go back to getting an honest rejection letter. To honestly, I, I really mean that. You could have had some of mine. <laughs> oh, I had enough. Don't worry about that. I mean, <laughs> no, I've, I've got my own fair share for both Galbraith and for, and for Rowling. But I had reached the point where, you know, some of my reviews on Potter were, revu- were reviewing my bank balance. Yeah. And a good review is, is something you learn from, right? I've always felt that, good or bad. Certainly not all reviews, I you know, because I still did have, you know, some interesting reviews and thoughtful reviews, but a lot of them really were reviewing me and the phenomenon and, as I say, you know, how much money I'd earned and, and it really had stopped being about the book for some reviewers. And I just had this craving for what I look back on very fondly because <laughs> we always forget how dark and, you know, it was to get those early rejection letters. I just wanted to go back to the simplicity of that. Then a a couple of publishers did show interest in Robert, so then I went with Little Brown, who said, we will keep your secret, and I got away with it for a while. It would have been really nice to get away with it for a bit longer. I wanted to have the pure writing experience and not have to go out and be JK, and it was wonderful while it lasted. I kind of... And it was satisfying. Exactly. Exactly Mm. that. Completely understand what you're saying about the excitement of starting over, but was it daunting having completed such a a, a colossal project with the Harry Potter series to think I'm starting from scratch now? I don't think I ever felt daunted in the in the sense of I now I have to begin again because I I mean by 2000 honestly I knew this will never happen again. You will never write anything a millionth as successful. I, I knew that. So I had I'd made my peace by that. But when I finished Potter, I felt bereft, utterly bereft. It had been there through 17 years. And the thing that the reader can never know is, is, is how much it gave to you, how much strength it gave to you to have that place to support you. You know, Potter had seen me through the death of my marriage, the, you know, birth of my first child, the fairly ugly breakup with my first husband. It had seen me through... Po- and when I say seen me through poverty, I meant mean it was a joyful thing to be doing while I was poor. I don't just mean it's that it... It's been constant. Exactly. It had been a constant for 17 years. 
And my poor husband, Neil, he took me away for the weekend, uh, not long after I'd completed Deathly Hallows, the seventh book. And we went to Venice and it was the most beautiful morning. And uh, we were sitting at breakfast and he's beaming across the table and I just burst into tears. And I said to him, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, it's just hit me, it's really hit me. It's over. It's really over. And I meant the writing. I, I knew that I still had the, you know, I, there was still the publication to come. I didn't mean that I thought everyone would stop reading Harry Potter books the moment the last book was published. But the big part, the part that meant the most to me was over and gone and could not come again, which was obviously the writing. And he was, he was just a trooper. He just let me talk. And I said to him, it feels like a bereavement. And then when I started to think about writing again, and you know, honestly, I didn't feel daunted because I'd made my peace with the fact that it couldn't be Potter. And I was just excited to have a new idea and, and work on something again. And you felt a huge sort of enthusiasm. For I, that. I genuinely did. I never felt scared or hamstrung by, not because I felt, wow, I'm so good at everything I do. I didn't, I never have felt that in my life. But it was more that I, this is what I love. And I'm back doing what I love. And that is more important to me than anything. And that remains the case. You know, I, that's how I feel. You've touched on this just now, but I mean, like everybody else in this world, you know, you've had a life of ups and downs. And, you know, as writers, we know that life brings sorrows as, as, as well as joys. Literary commentators are always keen, aren't they, to read biography into yeah, fiction. Yeah, so when it's said, for example, that the Dementors are a metaphor for depression, is that something that you accept? Were you deliberately trying to engineer plots that at some level would, would discuss in you and your life, or did that come as a revelation afterwards? Well, it's interesting you say the Dementors because the answer is 50-50. I consciously set out to um, embody depression. Not because I was trying to tell the world that I was depressed, not because I was trying to write biography, but because we do draw on our own experiences and my experience of depression was, was, a, was a very bad one, as it is for everyone who suffers from it. But at the same time, it is cathartic to take those things and turn them into fiction, particularly in such a, you know, I wasn't talking about someone being literally depressed. I was, I was turning depression into a, into a creature, so that was very satisfying. At the same time, I realised subsequently that their appearance owed everything to a dream I'd had when I was a child. That suddenly came back to me. Now, I'd remembered the dream, and I obviously knew exactly what the Dementors looked like, but it was... It, I don't even remember how long it was, but it might have been a couple of years before it suddenly clicked, and I thought, that's that dream. You, that's why the Dementors look the way they look. And I had a dream when I was a child that I was hiding from a creature that looked just like a Dementor, the empty black cloak and the withered hand and it was sort of drifting towards me it didn't seem to have feet um and I was terrified and I woke up I don't know if this happens to you but it's often happened to me that I've written something and then it's come to pass in my life and by the time the book comes out everyone assumes that you you know you're you're writing in response to or you're making a point about but the subconscious is an odd thing and, and sometimes it manifests things that haven't yet manifested in the real world. I, have you had that experience? Yeah, I, I have. And, and sometimes critics and commentators have pointed things out in the poems that I hadn't realised, but right. I, I, I recognise them as true once, once they're said. I mean, I don't think we always know what we're doing, do we? Definitely not. Definitely not. And the most clear-cut example of that for me People hearing me tell this story might think, well, that's so obvious, I can't believe you, you can possibly have not realised that, but it is the truth. On the night that my mother died, but I wasn't with my mother when she died, I was watching The Man Who Would Be King with Sean Connery and Michael Caine. So I later realised, when my father called to tell me that she died, that I, while she was dying, I had been watching that movie. In that movie, the, the Masonic sign of yeah. the compass is is important because it's a kipling it's story. a kipling story from a kipling story exactly my mum died in 1990 and i think deathly hallows had been out for five years when suddenly i realized why 
the Deathly Hallows looked the way the Deathly Hallows did. The sign for the Master of Death looks remarkably like the Masonic symbol. And even though it comprises three things that have been in the books from very early on, the symbol is made up of a representation of objects that have been there all along, I suddenly had this cold, chill moment because I, I, I saw the film again for the first time since my mother had died, and my whole body went cold, and I thought, your subconscious was working back towards that symbol. I had been writing Potter for six months before my mother died, and she never knew anything about it. And I realised in that moment why the Hallows looked exactly as they look. And that was such a personal memory and something no critic could have ever pointed out. I've, I've also had that experience where critics have said things. And I thought, yep, that's absolutely true. And I've, I have also, as I'm sure you have, had the experience of critics saying, this clearly means, and you think, you could not be more wrong. <laughs> you, you are a planet and a half away of what I know that was about, but I'm not telling you. Have you ever had that feeling? I mean, you were talking about you know, being in the shop with your, with your son. You know, we, we write in innocence, we write in isolation. It's, it's often just us and the page or the, or the keyboard. And then it, it goes out there and, and it becomes something else. And in your case, something absolutely extraordinary. Has there ever been a time where you thought this has got too big? Yeah, God, yes. I thought that about half, half an hour in. I, you have no idea, honestly. People who haven't been through this kind of experience, I think, don't understand what it feels like. You're, you're a writer, I'm a writer, and we are happiest in our sheds. So what happened was the Philosopher's Stone earned an unprecedented advance in the States. The Philosopher's Stone had done well very, very quick, quickly in the UK, so the publishers were thrilled, and then America was interested, and I got this very big advance, which actually enabled me to stop teaching and, and buy a house, which is incredible. And then the papers came calling. Suddenly the sun was on the phone. Could they write my story? And um, I had to start giving interviews. And I felt this is completely out of control. This is not what was supposed to happen. I found it incredibly scary. And as I've already told you the thing about the pseudonym, you can now understand why I found this sudden burst of publicity actually very frightening. That wasn't what I had meant to happen. My my little dream had been, you know, I'm going to one day hand over my credit card in a shop and someone will see the name. And Oh, my God, you wrote my favourite book. That was my fantasy. You know, I had this... I hadn't ever expected to be papped on a beach. You know, that's not supposed to happen to writers. You know, it, it's funny, really, because I've, I've become pretty bomb-proof but over the years and I've had time to ease into it. But then, if you told me then, this... This isn't going to stop. Because I thought, well, it'll stop. It'll stop. This will stop. This is just a, a crazy thing that happened because of the advance. If you told me then, no, 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 this, this is 30 years. I am not sure I could have written the second book. I think I'd have been too scared. You, you've absolutely no need to answer to any kind of literary criticism. The success of, of what you've done speaks for itself. But what about when that criticism becomes personal and it's not so much about the work but about your opinions as a, as a person? Does that make you question what kind of relationship you have with, with the public? I'm afraid that one of the quotations on my writing wall says, if you're not going to annoy somebody, what's the point in writing? Kingsley Amos. And that would be my view. I don't go out to provoke. Yeah, I'm, I'm honest. I'm honest about what I believe. And that, that comes with, you know, that comes with... Look... As writers, we get criticised. As people who are in the public eye, we get criticised. And that comes with the territory. I'm a passionate believer in a free press and freedom of speech. So I have to accept what comes with that. And I do. You, you get to a point, don't you, as a writer in terms of status or affirmation or you know how well known you are, that you can't whisper anymore. No, you can't whisper. But do you know what? Sometimes... The absolute truth is I would I have to be able to look myself in the mirror and I that's the person that I have to answer to more than anyone else. So I don't want success to make me cowardly. Yeah. So when, when, when people are critical of, of things that you believe in, does it make you want to, to go away and dream up a, a new persona, a new no. writing name? No, no. Galbraith was a very specific 
it was for a very specific reason and purpose. But no, I, do, I, I have no intention of um, pretending not to be me anymore. <laughs> what are you working on at the moment? I've just finished editing The Christmas Pig, which is my children's book that will be coming out before Christmas, unsurprisingly, given the, given the name. The Christmas Pig. The Christmas Pig. It, it doesn't turn out to be the Christmas Pork. No, oh, God, can you imagine? No, no, it's a, it's, a, it's a toy pig. I've had this idea kicking around for about 20, since 2012. I do know that because 2012 was, was the Olympics and I had the idea and was working on the idea on a holiday just before the, the Olympic opening ceremony, which was the, literally the most terrifying thing, because I was, I was in it. Oh, yeah, and it was, I've um, forgotten that. Yeah, yeah, literally the most terrifying thing I've ever done. So I can remember working on the book, and then every time I put, I, I, I put the story down, just having my heart, having palpitations at the thought of having to do it. Basically. Is it a short story? It's a short book. It's for younger children, I would say, and, um, yeah, I really love it. Does so, the pig speak? He does speak. Speak. And other things speak that you might not expect to speak. Yeah. Will, will there be an autobiography, something written by Joanne Rowling, which speaks your story from your point of view completely? Agatha Christie, I think, was 80-odd before she, she did it. And I think that's pretty much the perfect age to do it if you've still got all your marbles. With perspective... I'm not sure I will ever do it. As we've already established, I can't ever remember what year I did things in. So I'm just going to come across as a total fantasist. You know, 2021, I got married and people are like, no, you didn't. What are you talking about? So I have a very vivid memory in some respects and a very unreliable memory in other respects. Obviously, I have written a lot down, but not really about my life. So when I trawl back through notebooks it's like clues you know I've I, I will suddenly find a paragraph written about how I'm feeling in that moment and I'll think what made what made you think that and I can sometimes reconstruct it but no I don't think I I don't think I'm the memoirs type really as somebody now thoroughly steeped in the conventions of sorcery yes, uh, on indeed. one hand and crime on the other it strikes me that if anyone's capable of further literary masquerades and deceptions it's you and it makes me wonder if there are many many more books out there that you've secretly written under written. other names or that you are the hand behind other authors and in this shed joe yeah. while no one's listening yeah have you, i written all your you, poems you could, you could, well that was my next question <laughs> are you simon armistead <laughs> i i could prove how un simon armistead i am by opening this notebook Just and give showing... us the first no, line. No, I can't, I can't, the first I, can't, I can't. The first word. No, I... The first word. I'll give you the first word. I think it's the... <laughs> How promising. <laughs> How evocative. No, it's not. It's not the... It's there. There. T-H-E-R-E. E-R-E. I'm literally going red. There. Oh, that's interesting. Li- it's a sort of geographical beginning. It's about... Pl- I'm interested. <laughs> Please, don't give, be Just give us the last... No, I can't, give I can't. Give us the last word. Simon. And then in my, in my imagination, I'll string the two things together. No, honestly, you can ask me anything you like and I'll answer it, but I'm not reading that poem. <laughs> that's how bad it is. OK, well, instead, I'll read you a poem. So that's my it. task in the shed, this series has been to write everybody a haiku. Um, You know, these tiny, intense Japanese poems, Japanese tradition poems. When we write them in Britain, it's often five syllables, seven syllables, five syllables. And they're they're, they're quite often about the the weather and and the seasons and and so on. So this is the poem that uh, I've written for you, Joe. Do you want to take a look at it? I really do. Invisible ink. (laughs) Oh, you spotted it. Well, I am a witch. Come on. (laughs) Okay, so ostensibly this is a blank piece of paper, isn't it? Let me give you the secret. Oh, this is amazing. I've got a secret. I'm I'm going to call it a wand, but I think it's a UV pen. Oh, that's amazing. Morning, conjurer, whips back the dark sheet of night. Hey, presto, foxglove. Oh, that is so beautiful. You've got very interesting handwriting. <laughs> I'd, I'd love handwriting. Do you not love I do, just looking yeah. at people's handwriting? Yeah. Most people think I'm left-handed. That's so interesting because my father's handwriting slants back and he's left-handed. So I, that's exactly what I thought when you, when you showed me. Morning's conjurer whips back the dark sheet of night. Hey, presto, foxglove. 
That is beautiful. That's for you. And it, you, you better take this magic pen with you, Joe, so you can read it. Simon. <laughs> oh, it's incredible. We usually finish with a glass of Laureate Sherry. So this is... This is part of my sort of stipend or honorarium. It's a tradition that goes right back to John Dryden. You're kidding. You get yeah. your own sherry? I get my own sherry, yeah. 75 bottles a year. I'm uh, so envious. W- would you like a glass? I would love a glass. So this, this is the Fino, the, uh, the dry sherry from Hereth. Yeah. And it should be served cold. And it won't be today, but... I've got a tiny fridge in my in my writing room, um, which is actually broken. So for about a year I did have, I've never got anyone in to fix it, but for a year I did have chilled things in my little fridge. Well, I've got a sink in here, but it's not plumbed in. It's just covering a hole at the back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is amazing. Cheers. Good health. Cheers. Good Thank health Thank you so much you. for coming. It's been such a pleasure. Oh, I wish I was a, wish I was a better poet. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no one well, is going to send me booze for what's in that If you want to show people your work, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> now trust me. <laughs> um, that is that's very nice. I'm sure people have used this terrible pun before, but would you like a potter round the garden? I'd love a potter round the garden. Welcome to Descendants. The series which looks into our lives and our past and asks something pretty simple. How close are each of our lives to the legacy of Britain's role in slavery? And who does that mean our lives are linked to? Narrated by me, Yersa Daily Ward, we hear from those who have found themselves connected to each other through this history. Whoever you are, wherever you are in Britain, the chances are This touches your life somewhere, somehow. Descendants from BBC Radio 4. Listen now on BBC Sounds.